Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show where we talk about what's going on in the world of the Beatles newswise. I'm Ken Michaels. Most of you know me for a Beatles program that I host called Every Little Thing, syndicated around the country, and I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, and that, of course, is Steve Marinucci. Hi there, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hello, everybody. We've got the very special show in store right now, and we've been blessed for quite a while to have some great guests here on the show. And uh, this program is no exception, because we have with us on the phone someone who was uh, part of the duo of Peter and Gordon. He later became uh, the head of A&R for the Beatles company, Apple Records. And he had one of the most successful careers as a producer. So we welcome to our show, Peter Asher. Hi, hi Peter. Hi, how are you doing? Very happy to be here. Thank you. Peter's actually with us because he's about to, about to start uh, a tour, which he's actually been doing uh, on and off for the last several years. It's called Peter Asher, A Musical Memoir of the 60s and Beyond, featuring the music of Peter and Gordon. And uh, Peter, I, I thought that uh, we should just start uh, the show by having you tell us how you came up with this idea of making this your show, what it is, because to me it's kind of like Peter Asher's Storytellers. Well, in a way it is, yes. I mean, I, you know, as you know, Gordon and I didn't sing together for 38 years, you know, and we had to took a short hiatus from our musical career. And then we did get back together for, for a benefit at the behest of Paul Schaefer and, and then did a couple of years of shows, you know, two or three years, whatever it was, of shows before, you know, sadly Gordon died. And so when that happened, you know, I'd really enjoyed singing with him again. I'm very glad we did it. So then I kind of went, well... You know, does this mean I can never sing those songs again? Does that mean I won't sing on stage at all? Or, you know, uh, I was trying to figure it out. And, and at the same time, I also get asked to a lot to, 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 to lecture and stuff and make keynote addresses and stuff And because of some of the other things I've done. And I also realized when Gordon and I were doing our shows that people, as well as enjoying the songs, really enjoyed some of the stories I would tell. So I had this idea of trying to put together a show that combined all of that, you know, like me talking about the music business in general from the 60s till now, you know, me singing some of the old songs, me telling stories about that era and about, you know, the other eras I've been lucky enough to be involved with. And I work with James Taylor and Linda Ronson up to the, the present day when I'm in the middle of a million projects as we speak happily. So, so I had this idea to, to put together this whole kind of hodgepodge of storytelling and singing and combining it with a bunch of old videos and photos that I've saved and and um, so that's what I did is assemble it all into into one kind of big show and I that way I get to keep changing it I update it I discover new bits and pieces and throw them in there I update it with with new projects I'm doing now I've got a couple of exciting ones going on and so so that's uh, I know it's a long answer to a short question but that's kind of where the show grew so that's why it's a memoir of the 60s and beyond, and it is a, a multimedia kind of exploration of the music business and of various eras within it. Hmm. I know Steve and I have seen your show several times, and, and we both love it, and we love all the clips that you play. Are you a, a big archivist of your own material? Do you keep everything that no, you've ever no, done? No, no, I just... We just started rummaging and looking for stuff when this came up. I'm terrible at archiving. I have some friends, you know, uh, Bill Wyman being the most extreme, who are, like, brilliant at doing all that. You know, Bill, as you probably know, has an entire basement filled with Rolling Stone stuff that's just astonishing. Mm. I remember having dinner with him one night at his house, and we were reminiscing about a tour that we were on together with the Rolling Stones, Peter and Gordon, and Freddie and the Dreamers, of whom the headliner, by the way, was Freddie and the Dreamers. And... <laughs> And he not, and then he said, just a minute, and ran downstairs and came back with not only a ticket, but a program. So he not only has everything, but knows where it is. I'm afraid I'm the opposite of that. So yeah. when this show came to mind, it was a question of finding and assembling stuff that I remembered, you know, rather than reaching into my, uh, my honest own basement. I mean, I do now have a lot of stuff, but that's because we started assembling it all and researching for the show. Right. And, of course, many of us can go on YouTube and see a lot of Peter and Gordon material. And, and Exactly, exactly. So some of it is stuff. Some of this stuff is on YouTube. Some of it is things we found. And some of it, to be honest, is things that only I had. For example, I did have, and I'd lost it for a while, but it came up, for example, the original demo of World Without Love that Paul had recorded on my reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder in my bedroom for me to learn the song from. I do have that. So there are some things but I accidentally did, did successfully archive by losing and then finding it again. But 
but I can't pretend that it was a very organized process. But so there are some things that I've never been seen or heard before outside of this show. Have you considered doing what Ringo has done and putting on an exhibit of uh, of your stuff, maybe at the Grammy Museum? To be honest, I have not. You never know, but that that isn't something I don't think of myself as museum material. But you know, I think Ringo is of far greater significance and and, and deserves that kind of uh, thing. But no, I haven't. Since you mentioned A World Without Love, I, I thought I had to ask you a very specific question, because what you did play was a very short clip of the demo. Was the actual demo longer? I think I played the whole of the demo, actually. It never was longer than that? It was only about 20, 25 seconds. Yeah, well, don't forget, it didn't have a bridge, the right. song, at that point. He hadn't written the bridge, so it was just one verse. In other words, I have the lyrics written down, which I also show, so he just sang one verse so that we get the melody and the chords right. Hmm. That is the demo. Yeah, uh, going it's, back to... In the, its entirety, it's just one verse. Yeah, the the clips that you show uh, in the program, in particular, I'm, I'm not sure if it was Hullabaloo or not, but I love the one where there's a whole bunch of groups that come on the show and you do a medley of songs, including Eight Days a Week, and the Supremes are there, and... Is that, yeah, is that Hullabaloo? Hullabaloo? Yes. Yeah, that's wonderful Sorry? to watch. That's wonderful to watch. Yeah, it's fun. And, and of course, you know, it's extremely nostalgic you know, for me to watch every night because I remember, you know every detail of the day we did the show. Peter, yeah. do you happen to know, was there any kind of process for people like you and for Billy J and uh, that got Lennon and McCartney songs, how it was chosen that you were going to get which songs to record? Uh, that... Well, it did, it did no, that, I mean, that, that puts it kind of in the wrong light. I mean, in other words... Well, without love, I think you know the story. It was an orphan song, you know. I think, I think, in fact, Billy J did offer it and turned it down. So, when Gordon and I got a record deal and had a contract and had an upcoming date, I went back to Paul because he played me the song just as a friend. As you know, we shared the top floor of uh, my family home at that point, so we saw each other every day when they weren't on the road. So I knew the song, you know, and it was a leftover song. So I just said to Paul, "Look, we've got a record deal. Can we have that song?" And he said, "Yes." Uh, and then nobody I know he specifically wrote as a follow-up for us. So I don't think it was a question of, like, who should we give this song to? I think, I mean, those two each had a particular story. I Don't Want to See You Again, he wrote for us, and so, and Woman. So um, I don't honestly know much about the Billy J. Kramer songs, whether they were given to, you know, Brian Epstein or something to decide who, you know, whether there was a discussion about who to whom they should be given, or whether they were designed for Billy Jay, I don't know. But I think each song has a separate story. There was no formula. Peter, what was it like when you when you first reunited with Gordon for that uh, Mike Smith benefit? I was very proud to be a part of that because I worked at XM Radio at the time and I was one of the MCs. And, oh, uh, right, just... indeed you were, of course. I'd forgotten. That's right. That was a great evening. I mean, mostly uh, we were quite scared, I think, because, you know, it's, uh, we hadn't done it for a very long time. And it was one thing to, to make a verbal commitment, you know, which would be an absolute commitment to, to Paul Schaefer, who was, who was a good friend of mine, to say, you know, okay, we agree this is important. We agree it's a good cause. We'll do it. That was one thing. And then, you know, as a month later, when you realize, oh, shit, we actually have to rehearse this and make it sound good and <laughs> show up and not look stupid and, you know, make sure we still sound like Peter and Gordon, that was scary. Uh, and so we, we did a lot of rehearsals. Yeah. Was it very comfortable working with him again? Was it like putting on an old pair of shoes or was it really hard work? No, the, musically it was it was hard work, but it came together pretty quickly. You know, we were pleased. We said once we sort of we we you know, we relearned it as a bit off the record because Gordon had been singing the songs on his own for some time and changing them a lot, you know, to mm. suit himself. So I said, look, it's very simple. What we have to do here. We have to learn our parts off the record. We have to sing it exactly the way we used to sing it then. And if we can do that, it'll be fine. And that's what we did. And um, and you know, once we'd done that. It actually was very reassuring because we started singing and go, you know, you know what? Amazingly enough, we still sound like us, and uh, that's okay. And you know, Did you I record got record any studio stuff um, while you were when you got back together, Peter. Yeah, we did. We did one song. Uh, we did because we'd done um, uh, we'd done a, a Carnegie Hall tribute to Elton John and Bernie Taupin, where everyone had picked a, an Elton song and done it, um, which is funny because I'm in the middle of an Elton project now, but. We, I'd always loved like that newer Elton song, I Want Love, the one that had Robert Downey in the video. And I knew that every, you know, everybody else would be going for the old classic Eltons. And I thought I Want Love was a great song that we could do. So we did that 
in the benefit in Carnegie Hall, and it went well. People liked it. So we did actually go in the studio and cut a version of that, but that's the only uh, Peter and Gordon new recording from the, uh, you know, what one could loosely call the uh, the comeback era, you know. As yeah. it were. Did you talk about doing more material together, possibly? Uh, I can't remember. We might have, but we didn't do it. Yeah. I got to tell you, one of my favorite moments in seeing your shows is when you when you play back the old clips and then the band plays to the song. When Gordon yeah. sings the lead vocal, I think with True Love Ways, it's like he's yeah. there with you, you know, yes. on, as part of the show. He really was yeah. in every sense of yeah. the word. No, it, it's cool. It's 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 an emotional and uh, interesting moment, and it's you know he's still the person I enjoy singing with the most. I mean, my, the band I have now and my band leader Jeff Ross do a fan fantastic job you know in in filling in the missing bits but but uh i've got to say you know gordon is still the person i would i would rather sing with and that's the only way we can do it so we do yeah because you know he and i just we, we got lucky we tried singing together all those years ago it just kind of worked you know and, and people liked the way it sounded so we we kept going yeah how did you uh assemble this band that uh you have to back you up Mostly, uh, I think Jeff Ross, the band leader, put most of it together. You know, um, they're all LA. They're all excellent LA musicians. You know, who I who I use on on a lot of other projects I do as well. So um, we just put it together. You know, there's there's a lot of great musicians in LA, and we we got some of the best. Yeah, it's a wonderful band. It really it really is. Um, Peter, did you? Um, I I haven't asked you this um, before, but. Do you have any thoughts about Jackie Lomax's passing? Um, just how sad it was. I hadn't seen Jackie for quite a while. And it was funny, I was talking to somebody about him just the other day. This guy called Ed Saunders, who was, who was a friend of Leonard Cohen's, and I was out on the Leonard Cohen tour for a couple of days, and talking to Ed, who's a, who's a, a real hi musical history buff, and he'd actually seen Jackie not long ago, and this was the day before he died. So... Um, we were talking about him and what a good singer it was, and I was kind of thinking, God, I haven't seen him for a while. I should look him up, you know. And the next thing I know is I'm getting emails saying that he died. So um, it was very sad, you know. It's, it, it, it keeps happening. <laughs> you get to my age, <laughs> tragically, you know. You, um, you know, you, one loses friends from time to time. And, and I, I did feel bad that I hadn't seen him for a number of years. And there are so many artists that were on the Apple label that put out really strong material. In the case of Jackie, that the album Is This What You Want was really just powerful, really great material. Well, yeah, that. we thought so. I was, I was at a lot of those sessions, and they were terrific, because, you know, you had Ringo playing drums, you had Eric Clapton playing guitar, Klaus Borman playing bass, I think, on a lot of it, and maybe McCartney on some of it. It was it's a good record. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you something about that time at Apple, because... Depending upon which sources you read, you will hear that there are a lot of great artists who were turned down at Apple, including Crosby, Stills, and Nash, um, Fleetwood Mac. And in fact, there's a book that Norman Smith put out a few years ago before he passed away, where he even says that John Lennon turned down Queen and Paul McCartney turned down David Bowie. Is any of this true? Because I don't he, think so. I, I, I don't remember any of that. Maybe it happened after my time. I've heard the, the Bowie's the one, the one, the one I've heard most often, but not on my watch, no. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't really know. As an A&R person, what do you look for in an artist, most of all? I mean, obviously, James Taylor, <laughs> you know, is a natural. Oh, just to, to, to be astonished, you know, you never know till you hear it. You know, if, if you, it's, it's what you're not looking for, that, looking for specifically, that is what you want, you know? I mean... James was, you know, when, when everyone else was li listening to rock and roll bands, he was suddenly this guy who looked like a folk singer, but was not, in fact, a folk singer. But, you know, you, you, you got categorized as that because those days, if you had long hair and a guitar, you were a folk singer, even if you never sang a folk song in your life. Hmm. And he was a, a singer-songwriter before the term existed. And I just thought they were the best songs and the best guitar playing and the best singing I'd heard for years. And it wasn't what I was expecting at all. I didn't know that's what I was looking for. But I sure as hell knew once I heard it that it was the real thing. Yeah. So the answer is you, 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 you don't know what you're looking for. You're looking to be amazed. You're looking to be surprised. You're looking to be, you know, astonished. Who has surprised you in recent years, Peter? Uh, oh, I'm a huge fan of Ed Sheeran. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Miguel, uh, Bruno Mars. 
there's all kinds of great people out there making great music who can sing and play and write and everything else. Since you're so well known for producing James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt, uh, of the other artists that you've produced, who are you, you know, most proud of of your of your work with them? Gosh, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm usually proud of things I've done, you know, most recently. I think everybody is. You know, I, the Steve Martin, Edie Brickell album I did just a few months ago, uh, I'm very proud of. You know, I think it's it, it came out really well. Everybody likes it. It's done well. I had a great time making it. Edie Brickell, I was a big fan of, but I'd never met her before and worked with her. I mean, I'd met her very briefly because I know Paul, her husband, but... Uh, I was astonished by what a great singer she is, and Steve I already knew to be an astounding banjo player. So I suppose I would go, you know, with recent projects because that's the ones that are on my mind. So there have been, there's been other things over the years, some albums that, you know, didn't do as well as I thought they should. I did an album with a brilliant Canadian singer called Amanda Marshall, who you may well know, you should, and I thought that was a terrific album. It didn't do as well as I, I thought it should, but I'm still proud of it. So it, there's, there's quite a few, I suppose. Yeah. Didn't you produce the Williams Brothers? I did, yes. They yeah. were really good. Great yeah. singers. I had I that like CD. a good duo, and they were a good duo. Yeah, they harmonized great together, too. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about Linda Ronstadt and, you know, what uh, the, the recent news about her voice? Um, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> she told me she told me a long time ago, uh, two years ago or so, that she didn't think she could sing properly anymore. And we all tended to kind of go, Lindy, you're crazy, don't be insecure, you know, you're the best singer in the world, which I believe, by the way, she's my favorite girl singer of all time. And um, in fact, of course, she was correct. What she was noticing was the early symptoms of a disease that, that was diagnosed, um, you know, uh, about a year ago, I guess, which is when she told me that she discovered that she actually had Parkinson's. And the reason she was singing, she, she didn't feel she had the appropriate control of her voice was, in fact, this muscular thing that happens with that particular disease. And then, of course, it, recently she she's, you know, made it public. So it, that's why there's obviously a lot of people talking about it now. But it's... Um, you know, she's addressing it with fortitude and, and and scientific detachment to some degree and certainly with a great deal of courage and determination and is doing fine. I've talked to her often. And plus, by the way, you should read her book, which is fantastic. I unashamedly plug her book. I think it's okay to plug things for when friends do something really good. And her book is terrific and well worth reading and getting great reviews, by the way. Yeah. Is there a favorite of yours that you produce with Linda? Uh, I think I'd probably say you're no good. You know, it was that one thing where we, we worked on it very hard for, you know, sort of many hours. And, and when it was finished, we did on it, we kind of went, this is good. You know, this is cool. Mm. This could be a hit record. And it was. So I think if I picked a single track, that would be it. If I picked an album, it would probably be Cry Like a Rainstorm, Howl Like a Wind with the duets with Aaron Neville and the big orchestra and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Very nice. How about James? How about how about uh, your favorite track of James? I don't know. Maybe it might be you've got a friend, but um, you know, because there, there again we had that feeling of triumph when we when we finished the record. We really thought we got it right. You know, I put those Johnny Mitchell background vocals on and a little bit of percussion, kind of listening back and going, you know, this this is good. So, and that's a great feeling. I'm not sure what my favorite James album would be. Uh, actually, it's the, they're all pretty good. I've got so many favorite songs. I don't know. Hmm. You you told me many years back that uh, well, when the Mike Smith benefit happened, that you thought that the uh, the debut album from James, the one on Apple, you you think was overproduced. Yeah, I did say that because it, I do. Um, I just think that in my determination to make people sit up and take notice of him, I might have. You know, I, I tried very much to say this isn't just a guy with a guitar. These are really important songs. So I would put like a string quartet here and some horns here and some percussion here. And I think in the end, my enthusiasm may have, may have caused it to be a little over-decorated. But some people love it. So, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not against it. But certainly it was in reaction to that that Sweet Baby James was, I did very simply. Hmm. Well, I always loved the production on that album. And did James ever tell you what he thought? No, James doesn't say much. <laughs> um, I don't know. He was a little distracted during that album. He wasn't in the greatest of shape, so a lot of it was up to me because he was, you know. Um, but then later on, he obviously became much more closely involved in the production of his own records and had brilliant ideas of his own. 
Well, I think when you added the strings and the horns, it gave it a bit of a classical feel. So that made it even more unique. So it kind of stood out. Well, it out. did. That's what we were, I mean, that was the point, is to try and make it unique. Absolutely, that was the point. My only concern is, in retrospect, that that may have buried the songs a little bit under, under the determination to be unique. But, but, but thank you. Hmm. If you had to pick a, a, a least appreciated uh, moment of the Apple Records output that people should be, pay more attention to, what would it be? I think it would be Jackie, especially today, but I think in general it probably would. I think now would be a good time for people to rediscover the Jackie Lomax album. It's a damn good record. I know we covered that already, but I, I, I'm sort of giving two answers, the same answer to two different questions. But I think uh, Jackie Lomax is, is important. It's a good record. It's pretty incredible, all the artists that had success after Apple, like yeah. Billy, like Billy Preston, like James Taylor, um, yes. even Hot Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yes, even hot chocolate. That was again towards. I think I'd left by then. It was towards the end, anyway. But yes. Were you surprised at the success of those artists, or did you just think that um, that Apple, for one reason or another, couldn't make those records work, or maybe was it a, a promotion or a lack of promotion? For those? Which artists are we talking about? Well, Billy Preston, um, Jackie Lomax, those artists. I mean, I, I I don't know. Again, I think that was towards the end when I was leaving, anyway. But. I mean, Apple had some successes and some, you know, Mary Hopkin obviously was a big hit and then other things did less well. Right. I wanted to bring up, there was one concert that I saw with you and Gordon uh, on Long Island at Westbury Music Fair. And what made that very special was that you were on the bill with Chad and Jeremy. Yes. And you would have thought that all these years you must have played together. But you said that was right. the only time not, ever. No, that was a, a unique opportunity to prove to everybody that, that we actually were two different duos, because as I'm sure you know, we got mistaken for each other from time to time. They would do a TV show and people would congratulate us and vice versa. So on that particular occasion, I did work, I worked out a four-part version of Bye Bye Love, figuring the Everly Brothers is where we should meet. And... Um, we did it on stage all together, finally proving physically beyond any reasonable doubt that there were two different duos, yeah. that we were not the same people. Because the coincidence was kind of extreme, you know, two, two duos of, of, of Englishmen, one, one tall, handsome one who sang the low part and a shorter one with glasses who sang the high part. It was pretty unusual that we were, that, that we were easy to mistake for each other. Right. Were you friends with each other? Yes, and still are. Yeah. Was there any competition? Yes. Between? <laughs> I mean, undoubtedly. But there's competition in the music business anyway. There's competition all over the place. But, of course, there was competition. Right. Peter, had you and Gordon ever, ever considered doing acting roles? Not necessarily like they did. I mean, not the sitcom type of thing, but had you guys considered doing a movie or something like that? I don't think anybody ever offered us one. I mean, I, I, I have had an acting career, as you probably know. I started as a child actor and continued to act from time to time. But I don't think uh, Gordon and I were ever offered anything. We, well, I don't know if we would have done it or not. But, yeah, they did the Patty Duke show and Batman and all kinds of stuff that we did not do. Hmm. We didn't think about it much one way or the other. But I think if someone had asked us, then we would have considered it. Why don't you tell us about this uh, tribute album to Goodbye Yellow Brick Road that you've been working on? Well, it's the 40th anniversary of Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, which is crazy, because I think of it as one of Elton's later albums, but it was 1973. They're re-releasing you know, a deluxe package and a remastered and all that, the beginning of the year. And uh, so uh, Elton asked me to, to recut uh, half of the songs on that album, uh, with current people, so we, I got to do, uh, you know, pick some of the artists I greatly admire now, like Miguel and Ed Sheeran, Hunter Hayes, Fall Out Boy, the band Perry, and so on, and cut uh, Yellow Brick Road songs with all of them. So, for example, I've done with Miguel, I did um, Benny and the Jets, and so on. Oh. So it's, it's, and you know, Ed Sheeran did Candle in the Wind, and I'm finishing that now. We're we're in the middle of actually trying to get a couple of things sorted out to to finish it uh, in the next few days, and I've got more mixing to do as soon as I get back to LA tomorrow, and then that album will be done and delivered. For certain it's, songs, it's pretty really exciting. I'm very pleased with it. Yeah, for certain songs that are now considered classics, like Goodbye Old Brick Road and, and Benny and the Jets, yes. do you try yes. to keep it true to the original arrangement, or let the artists do what they want? 
Uh, neither. Uh, I, I figured out kind of what I thought would work for that artist and, and which songs would suit whom uh, in conjunction with many conversations with Elton, who was, you know, very involved. And, uh, you know, I discussed a lot of my ideas with him first. So it was neither of those. It was I, I wasn't particularly staying true to the original arrangement. I was trying to find an artist and a new arrangement that I thought would bring out some, some new aspects of the song. Peter, can we um, talk about... Um your role in the uh, upcoming uh, uh, BBC Two album. Are we able to talk about that? Well, they just asked me to. Um, Apple have asked me if I would be available to to talk to people who want to know what those BBC sessions were like, you know. And since I did a no quite a number of them with Peter and Gordon, plus, um, you know, I, I attended a couple of the Beatles did. Uh, they asked me if I would be willing to talk about it, and I said yes. You know, they basically said, if we have some, you know, are you willing to do some, some press and, and talk about this to whomever? And I've said yes, but exactly you, to whom and when and about what, I don't know. Did you say that you had observed one of the Beatles BBC sessions? Yes, I did say that, yes. You wanna, do you want to talk a little bit about that? or? Well, I mean, just you know, one was again impressed as one always was by what an incredibly good band they were, you know. They... they they just sang and played really well. I mean, the, the BBC was technically expert, so they mic'd them well, and they'd go in there and just knock out these songs. Because, you know, they're like, they'd done their 10,000 hours or whatever it is Michael Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell talks about. Um, they they were ready, and they would just go in the studio and, and do a great performance of a song. And the BBC would record it. It was exciting to be there. You know, I would sit in the room with them live and... I know I was at one, I might have been at two, but I remember one distinctly, and just being impressed by how well they sang, how good they were, you know. They were loud, too, singing. They sang really loud. Hmm. I think that's the German club training with terrible PAs, that they, they would just sing really strongly. Peter, did you ever consider writing your own biography? I did, and I do not want to. And I've considered why is that? it in the sense that I've decided not to do it. How come? I much prefer doing the show. Right. Um, in the show, I can, I can change things, I can fix things, it can be different every night, I can answer questions. So the show is my autobiography. I don't intend to write a book. I've you know, received some offers to do so and have declined them. Now, of course, I never say never because you know, a year from now, you and I might be on the phone and I'll be plugging my book. But <laughs> um, it is not my intention to write one. Yeah. Okay, so as we speak, you are actually starting your tour tonight. And, yes. uh, I'm at uh, Yoshi's in Oakland tonight, uh, and then we've got uh, the Grammy Museum on October 12th, and New York, uh, the Cutting Room on November the 5th, and some other stuff that just case my mind. Uh, right. PeterAsherMusic.com is the site that has all that stuff on it. And is it likely you'll be adding more dates? You never know. Uh, it depends, you know, what I can fit in. But if, if a cool date comes up that fits into, or, you know, other plans, then I'll take it. Okay. Well, we recommend to all of our listeners to go to your website to always check it out so you can find out if Peter's playing near you. And the website, again, is peterashermusic.com. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. This has been a blast. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, anytime Great you want to come on, both. anytime you want to come on, just let us know. Thank you very much. I will do. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. All right. This has been so much fun. Peter Asher joining us. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today, thanking you so much for uh, being here, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying we will see you next time.